Hi folks, thank you for joining us. We are live here again in Stumac Studio. Uh, my name is Pete and I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for episode five, our finale. Uh, you know what, I think I'm not muted here, excuse me. Let me get that taken care of. Sorry about that everyone. Uh, like I said, my name is Pete. Welcome to our episode five, the finale of our live build along series. We're, we've been building our 57 mini tweed five watt, five watt amp kit. And, uh, you know, last episode, we installed the eyelet board into our chassis to have something like this here. In this episode, we're going to be taking that chassis and installing it into the cabinet that we prepared in episode one. But before we get into that, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If, you're, if you've been here all along, welcome back. Um, we're really, really excited to get into today, today's episode. Uh, just are a little nervous. Hopefully everything turns out well. <laughs> um, but before we get into that, uh, I'd like to thank you, Tommy Stump. Thanks, Pete. For joining us again. Lead us all through this. Um, of course, we have our videographer, Rachel. Hey, everybody. And our wonderful director, Susan. Hello. And uh, as we've been doing all along throughout the series, we're going to go ahead and start off with some important safety tips to follow. Um, so, Tommy, if you're ready to take it away. Yeah. So, in this episode, at the end, we're going to be working in a live amplifier circuit. Um, amplifiers, tube amplifiers in particular, have extremely high voltages sometimes. Um, so we need to be able to understand how to deal with that properly in case we need to get in there and make any adjustments or repairs. So uh, this is the amp I was just playing. It's a live circuit. It's had tubes in it, which means it has the potential to have 600 volts of DC stored in the filter capacitors. The filter caps, just to show you, are these larger blue ones over here next to the power transformer. So your power transformer takes your wall voltage, which in the US is around 120, sometimes it can be 125, um, and it steps that up. And then the rectifier tube turns that high AC voltage into DC. And it can be over 500 volts in this particular amplifier. So what I'm going to do is show you that voltage and then show you how to properly discharge it using a snuffer stick. So what I'm going to do is turn this amplifier back on with just the rectifier and test the voltage at this first filter cap point. It'll be north of 500 volts. Um, these other tubes will pull that DC voltage down. They'll also drain your voltage when your amplifier is turned off if your circuit is working properly, but you don't want to rely on that ever um, because at any time something could fail and you could be working on an amp with lethal voltage possibly. So right. it's just really good to have good habits just to begin with when you're working on amplifiers. Right, one of our safety tips is stay suspicious. Uh, obviously check power or check before powering it on um, and always unplug it when you're not working on it. Yeah, so I'm gonna be working with this multimeter. There's a couple tests that I'm gonna be doing throughout this episode. One of those is continuity represented by this diode symbol and the little speaker symbol. That's because on most multimeters, when it's set to continuity, if the leads touch or if the leads are making an electrical connection with each other through your circuit, you'll hear a beep. And on this meter, it lights up as well, letting you know that you have continuity without having to look at the meter. The other test we're going to do is DC voltage. Some multimeters have a range where you set it for what you expect to be testing. Other multimeters are what's called auto ranging where you don't need to set what range you're gonna look for, you just set it to DC or AC 
AC is represented by a sine wave, as you can see here. DC is represented as a solid line with dots. Um, and again, those are very standard uh, electrical sim symbols. So what I'm gonna do is clip a test lead onto my multimeter's negative probe, the black one. You can see that. What I'm gonna do is connect it to a known ground point. Ground is connected to this green AC cord. And essentially it's anywhere in this chassis that's got a mounting bolt. These terminal strips are ground. There are a lot of different ground points that you can choose. Um, for our purposes, and so we can see what I'm doing on camera, I'm gonna clip it onto one of these mounting bolts up here through the cabinet. I'm gonna choose this one because it's the most out of the way as far as camera work. And uh, for anyone who has been following along with us throughout the entire series, uh, this is sort of a review of uh, the safety tips we went over in episode one where we did demonstrate the snuffer right. stick. Uh, this is just a little review, refresher, a little more in depth. So I'm gonna check continuity just to make sure that this black test lead is indeed grounded. I'm gonna touch a few different places on the chassis and one of my terminal strips. Cool. So I know that this is grounded. That's a good sign because when we test DC voltage, we need to test it against ground. You have your negative lead on, on ground. You have your positive lead set to the test point you're looking at. So what I'm gonna do is set my multimeter to my 600 DC range. I'm using a test lead because I never wanna have both of my hands inside the chassis when there's a possibility that there's DC voltage present. So what I'm gonna do for demonstration purposes is turn this back on just for a couple seconds. And as I said, I'm going to that first test point. Do you want me to show you that again, Rachel? Or... Yeah, let's see it one more time. Okay, so that first test point where the red lead meets that blue resistor is where I'm gonna test first. That's gonna be the highest DC voltage in this amp. And you can see on that multimeter, 520, so it's a lot of voltage. Now what I'm gonna do is clip my snuffer stick to another ground point on the chassis. And I'm gonna show you how this thing will drain that voltage. So I've got that test probe on there. You can see that tube is slowly draining it, but I wanna quickly drain it. So I'm gonna place my snuffer stick on that same lead and you can see it just drop like a rock there. A snuffer stick in general is two resistors wired in series that are clipped to ground. The resistors stop the voltage from immediately all jumping into ground. And it's got a non-conductive wooden handle. So you can see I'm down to four volts on my multimeter. That is safe to work on. You can see these other two filter caps that I'm testing are just a little bit higher. Anything below 10 volts DC is considered safe to work on. And if you're following along in the instructions, all of these safety tips and the directions on how to use the snuffer stick are on page six. Right on. So again, why do we have to keep harping on this? If we were building a ukulele kit, we would not be talking about this. Even a pedal kit, you're only working with roughly nine volts at most. In this circuit, as you can see, we're working with 500 volts of DC which is enough to stop your heart. So it's just really important that we talk about it and go over it anytime we're gonna be working in a live amplifier, which we will at the end of this episode. All right, uh, so yeah, thank you, Tommy, for taking us through that again. Uh, very important stuff to pay attention to. Uh, but now we're so close to the fun part, uh, I think we should just get right into it, right? Absolutely. So right off the bat, step 63, so mounting our chassis. Now there's one thing I like to do before we mount the chassis, just for ease. I like to mount this chicken head knob first, just because it can be tough to get it mounted on there properly with the chassis in the cabinet. So there's just a small brass set screw. Can you see that, Rachel? I can. Far out. Make sure that's backed out enough 
using a small screwdriver, slot head, so that you can allow the, the brass ring to slide on over that pot control shaft. I point the knob just past one, moving counterclockwise on my chassis, if you can see that. And then just spin that set screw until it grabs on. Don't need to bear down. Again, it's just so it doesn't spin free. Now I can hear it. Now I have it a little bit, I turned it a little too far. I didn't have my knob all the way off. So what I'm gonna do is turn that all the way off. It's just a little mistake there. Tighten that again. So now when I turn it all the way up, which you're gonna wanna do, it's on 12. All right. Good All right, pro so tip. now we're going to mount our chassis. Yeah, essentially what Tommy's done there is just moved step 66 ahead of 63 to just simplify making sure you can align that knob. Yeah, it can just be a little bit of a trial and error, just a little bit of a pain if you don't mount that knob first. Hey, Tommy, um, while you're getting that ready, we've got our first question here uh, from Sassy Cat. Sassy Cat, thank you for joining us again. Welcome, Sassy Cat. A uh, bit of an odd question. How much... Electricity does the human body contain? I think it depends on the body. <laughs> I don't really know. And um, then I'm an amp guy, not follow up human, otter question. How much can it guy. safely absorb? Uh, I think that also depends on the body, but generally you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're trying to absorb extra electricity. It's my one of my rules of life. So I've got these mounting bolts. They should pass right through that tweed cabinet. Sometimes this tweed can overlap those holes. Not a big deal. You can see here, I just folded it back on this one. It's not gonna cause any problems. And I'm gonna just pass the mounting cha the chassis over those mounting bolts. I'm gonna make sure these white wires on the left-hand side, this white and black lead are out of the way. Because this bolt, if you can see that, Rachel, you can't see it at the angle, but it's just a, yeah. this mounting bolt over here is very close to these AC wires. And if the nut squishes those wires, you can cause a problem. Um, just want to be extra careful that you don't damage any of those wires. So I'm going to get those locking nuts threaded on to the bolts. Let's get that guy out of there. All right. And so uh, while you're doing that, we've got a couple more questions coming in, which everyone who's joining us, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. That's why we're doing this live, so we can answer your questions. Um, Santiago Colina asks, now that we're coming to an end, do you honestly think anyone could make this? And they say thanks and happy end of year, you guys. Uh, you rock. Uh, yeah. I mean... We, we've broken the instructions down into simple step-by-step, -step, the best way we know how. And as you can see, nothing I've done is way out there as far as complicated techniques or anything like that. We're going to leave this video up for I, the foreseeable future. Um, so if you ever decide you want to build this, you can go back and check and make sure you're doing it how how we like to do it but i really do think this is a great place to start for anyone who wants to get into amp building and so you can see i've got those mounting nuts on there i'm just going to go ahead and tighten those and once they're close it's a good idea to pull that chassis up um, so it's pretty far up so it'll be flush with where the back panel mounts um, when we get to the end. All right. And uh, Santiago Colina, thank you for your question. You rock. Um, mm -hmm. We've got more questions coming in. Uh, Metal571 asks, do you think we can get a circuit analysis with the math behind how the component uh, values were selected and the function of each component would love that. Uh, just a quick, short uh, answer while Tommy's doing that. Uh, we do have the schematic 
available in the instructions on page 29. As far as the how the components were selected, um, I would assume, Tommy, you can correct me if I'm incorrect here, uh, that they were selected based on the vintage uh, 5F1 circuit that Fender designed. Well, I, I think what he's asking is uh, for a circuit analysis, meaning where the voltages are at each point in the circuit and what each component does. Um, this is the simplest amp circuit you're probably going to see as far as a tube amp. So uh, the circuit analysis is pretty basic. There are a lot of resources on the web. I would particularly shout out Rob Robinette's website. Um, he has a great website full of awesome information, especially regarding this amplifier. He uses this as the basis for his How, how Amps Work um, article. So it goes through every step of the way, what each component does. We don't really have the time to do it here live on YouTube, but if you guys want something like that, that is something where we could absolutely make some kind of follow-up where I talk about how the, how the signal's routed, how the power is routed, what each component does, and why, why certain values are what they are. Um, so yeah, if, if that's something people are interested in, we can, we can definitely try to make some type of follow-up episode. Yeah. So leave your, uh, suggestions or your requests in the comments. Um, yeah. And just to answer Gregory Hill senior asked, um, will we be replaying this series? It's gonna uh, stay it up. is going to yeah. stay up on our channels archive. So it's going to be available for the foreseeable future. I don't see why we would we yeah. would take it down for any reason. All right, so moving along, this next step is installing our fuse. It's a one amp slow blow fuse, one of the most common for this style of amplifier. That just drops right into that socket. And you can see on that fuse cap, it's got little nubs on the side. I don't know if you can see that well, Rachel. Oh, yeah. Okay. And there's, there's notches in the socket as well. So I'm just gonna line those up with that socket. And then it just turns a quarter turn. Um, once you just push it down a little bit, should click right in, lock that in place. And then we know our fuse is in there solid because this guy, if you remember in the previous episode on this fuse socket, this tab was kind of spinning free and now it's got a good amount of pressure on it. So we know our fuse is properly installed there. And again, that's just a safety feature in case something goes wrong in your amp, it'll help protect some of the other components. And uh, for everyone following along in the instructions, that is the end of step 64 on page 25. Yep, now we're on to step 65, installing the pilot lamp. So I remove that jewel lens. Yeah. Again, that just threads into this socket, the lamp socket. I'm going to get my number 47 pilot lamp. and drop it in and if you can see in the socket there's kind of a, a right angle here you move that white wire up yeah there it is there's kind of a right angle and again there's notches on the lamp can you see those rachel mm -hmm. those notches should drop right in give it a little twist and it'll hold it in those little that is a retainer notch there so that looks good. I'm going to reinstall my jewel lens. And if you're not a fan of this classic red, we do sell a lot of other colors. I have one with amber at my house. It's kind of classy. Hey, Tommy, can you uh, say that link one more time? I think it was Rob Robinette. Rob Robinette, R-O-B-B, no, R-O-B-I-N-E-T-T-E, -E, Robinette. If you search how amps work, it'll likely take you to his page. And again, this is called the 5F1 circuit. He has a ton of info about all the most popular amp circuits throughout the years, especially kind of the formative years between, say, 1955 and 1965. So we are on to step 67 since we already installed our volume knob. Right. So for this, we're going to clamp our power cord. 
if you remember, we installed this in episode one. We're just gonna unscrew that screw. So just a Phillips head. And I don't know if you can see that anymore, Rachel. Okay. Yeah, we'll show them where it is at. So just unscrew that screw. Pull it out of the little clamp and then clamp it on your power cable. Doesn't really matter how much slack you have. I like to have just a little bit at least um, just so I can route that cable out of the way so it's not banjo tight right up top to the chassis. Yeah, I think we say six inches in the instructions. It's really yeah, just that's a good about, that's about six. Good recommendation. Yep. So I'm going to get that screw back through that clamp. Pretty simple stuff here. Screw that guy back in. No need to go crazy with that. But as you can see, my cable's not going anywhere. And it's held up against the side of the chat uh, the side of the cabinet there. Cool. All right. And so, we did it. Right? That's it. That is the end of the assembly part. The last thing we have to do is test just to make sure everything is what we want to see before we actually crank this thing up and hear how it sounds. Right. Before we get to that, uh, everyone out there who's just joining us for a good show or building along with us, give yourself a big round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> and we know you want to hop right in and test it and get right to playing, but like it says in the instructions, there's a big stop sign. Do not install the tu tubes yet. Don't plug in the amp yet. And don't plug in your speaker yet either. So what I'm going to do is clip a test lead back onto a known ground point. I'm going to use that same one just so the camera can see everything I'm doing. The first test is a safe power up. No tubes installed. We're going to check AC voltage. For AC voltage, you test across both leads, not to ground. If you test to ground, you get half of what your voltage is. Um, so you can still do that. It's just not as accurate. So I'm going to disconnect my test lead from my meter and set my meter to AC voltage. And what we're going to do is check the AC voltage at pin nine and four and five on our 12AX7 socket. So I'm gonna get plugged in here. I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn my volume knob to three so that technically the amp is turned on, but still no power. This is so you don't need to reach in or around your chassis in case there is some type of severe problem. Uh, if anything's sparking, you're, you're better off unplugging it than reaching in near the circuit. All right, and we do have a couple questions, but this is some pretty important safety stuff, so I'm yeah. gonna hold on to that for a minute, S yeah, but we so, will get to your questions. So again, we're gonna just perform a safe power up. No need to test anything at this point. I just plug my amp in. I can see my pilot lamp is lit, and I don't hear or see or smell anything out of the ordinary. Um, this is basically just checking to see that we didn't wire anything improperly in regards to this green twisted pair that lights our lamp and also provides the heater voltage for our circuit. Um, I can see everything's looking good. So I'm happy with that. Tommy, what are you specifically looking for that would indicate there would be a problem? Sparks, smoke, uh, if this lamp didn't light, those are the big ones. Um, at this point, if you've wired everything properly, you are not going to see anything massively fail unless you have a defective component, which at this point, the only real components that are receiving voltage in the circuit are this the sockets for the heaters and also the AC 
coming out of the transformer. But again, um, we don't normally expect to see much happen at this point. So what we're gonna do, just to make sure everything is still hunky-dory, is check our AC voltage at our 12AX7 socket. So the 12AX7 socket gets this AC voltage through this socket as well as the lamp. So essentially we can confirm with a good voltage check here that all this wiring is good to go. So what I'm gonna do is tip this up so Rachel can kind of see. And for anyone uh, following shot, along in the instructions, uh, okay. this does say step 67 on page 26. Uh, we realized there was a little bit of an error. This is actually step 69. Um, it depends on when you're watching this. We may even have the instructions corrected online. Um, just like I said, depending on when you're watching this. Yeah. So I'm gonna check from each of these green leads to each other to see my AC voltage. Can you see that voltage on the camera, Susan? Yeah. Cool. And I can see I've got around nine volt. Oh, no, I don't. There we go. 7.1 is acceptable. Um, so that is just a little higher than it says in the instructions. The instructions say, four to five volts or five to seven volts AC. That's a range because there's a lot of variation in components, tolerances, as well as wall voltage. Um, I'm assuming my wall voltage is probably somewhere around 125. So I'm guessing just from that, that most of these readings are just gonna be a little bit higher than it says in the instructions. But certainly no cause for concern if it was somewhere in the range of four volts, our tubes wouldn't work. If it was somewhere in the range of 10 volts or something, then we might be looking at a, a real problem. But as long as it's within 10% or so, uh, probably good to go. Right. So we're good. We're gonna unplug our amp and we're gonna install our 5Y3 rectifier tube. And uh, while you're getting ready with that, uh, let me get back to this question. JDS asks, hi guys, I have a Fender Tweed amp and I noticed that it is quite noisy when turned on compared to my Vox AC15. What level of white noise is normal for an amp to have and is there a way to avoid it? Um, so normal versus acceptable, um, all amps are gonna hum. Yeah, sorry, that's our 5Y3 rectifier tube. And you can see it only has five pins. Also, on these octal based tubes, there's a registration key. It's kind of a ridge here between pins one and eight. And that will line up with the tube socket. Very important that that's lined up properly. I've seen people force these in a uh, quarter turn off or something it's not gonna work properly and it could damage the tube or the circuit if you do that. So really important that you pay attention to that registration notch there. Did you get all that, Rachel? So it's like the chopstick behind it, the way you had it real quick. And then you... Right here? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Cool. cool. All right. All right, so I'm just gonna visually locate that notch on the tube socket. Slide that guy right in. Um, so a Vox AC15, depending on when it was made, depending on whether it's a PCB amp or hand-wired amp, could have lower hum than a Fender Tweed. A lot of Fender Tweed amps um, have a different circuit than a, you know, they have a different circuit than AC15 and might have inherently more noise. But um, if it's something you're worried about and you don't have a, a friendly amp tech to help you, you can certainly, um, you can certainly check back on our previous episodes about uh, lead dressing. That can be a big help when you're trying to get rid of hum. You can also isolate your circuit with uh, copper tape, like we did in episode one. That can help uh, fight exterior noise. But if your amp is overly noisy, you might have bad filter caps. Those need changed every so often. So I'd recommend 
if you're if you're watching, we talk about filter caps a bit. Um, you could definitely check those, and you know they're not too expensive to replace. And uh, JDS Tommy mentioned that um, it was episode four, I believe, that we were discussing lead dressing. So if you want a refresher on that, check out episode four. So I'm going to go ahead and get my multimeter set back up for this step. Um, step 68 in the in these instructions, but it's probably actually step 70. Is that right? Uh, yes. So for this step, when we're testing the dangerous DC voltage, I'm going to hook my test lead back up. I'm going to get everything prepped before I plug the amp in. This step can cause stress on these filter capacitors. Normally, when your amp is functioning, there's going to be all your tubes installed, and they're going to pull this voltage down that we're going to check in this next step. With just your rectifier tube, these filter caps are getting more voltage than they're really supposed to. And in some cases, like what I expect to see, we're going to be over 500 volts. These are rated for 475. That's an operating rating, meaning they're safe to operate at 475 volts. If they go above that, there's a definite chance they could fail. So we do this check, this next test, as quickly as possible just to make sure our rectifier tube is working and that this wiring here is all good. Um, again, I recommend getting really everything cl as close to ready as you can before you plug the amp back in. So I've got my meter set to 600 DC. I've got my test lead ready and I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. So I can see my light bulb is on and I can see just barely that the filament in my rectifier tube is lit. So I'm going to go ahead and check that first point and I see 510 volts. That is what I expect to see. So I'm going to go ahead and unplug this. It's a quick check just to make sure that stuff is uh, working properly. The longer you leave that on there, the more stress it's going to cause to those filter caps. And it, you know, the longer you run it without any other tubes at this high voltage, the more likely these are to fail maybe prematurely. Again, nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that 510 volts. Point out the spot where you just tested it. Yeah, here, eyelet 16, where this resistor and red lead meet this first filter cap. And again, in that step, um, you're, you're looking for smoke, smells, you're checking your voltage, and getting in and out as quick as you can. So what we're going to do next is install our 12AX7, I believe. Tommy, do you have time for another uh, audience question? Yeah, so let me just answer it while I'm installing this. Yeah. This 12AX7 tube has nine pins. You can only install it in the socket one way, so there's no registration pin or anything. Just need to be sure that you get these pretty much lined up before you start pushing it in. These pins can bend, and then you need to contact service at stumac.com for a replacement. So go ahead, Pete. Shoot. Uh, it's actually kind of related to what you're doing right now. Uh, Eric Metallic, excuse me, Eric Metal EC says, I've always heard that you are not supposed to touch tubes with your bare fingers that the oils in your skin and fingertips could damage the tubes. Is that true? I think we discussed this briefly in a pedal build video, but can you uh, speak on this again? I have yet to destroy a tube by touching it. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'd say, you know, don't eat a grilled cheese sandwich while you're working on your amp. But otherwise, you know, having a fingerprint or two on these glass tubes isn't likely going to destroy them. Now, if they're really cranking and you touch them, you can burn yourself. And I have heard of people grabbing a hot tube and having it blow up, but it's not like say a halogen or tungsten lamp that you'd see in like a big expensive light where a fingerprint can absolutely cause it to blow. Um, I, I touch tubes all the time and I have yet to have one explode because of it. I explode them for other reasons. 
So we're gonna go ahead and check our DC voltage at islet 26. This is a lower voltage. We'll expect to see it between one and two volts probably. So I'm down on my six volt range on my meter. I'm gonna go ahead and plug our amp back in. So again, not seeing any smoke, anything like that. And islet 26, all the way at the end here, is where we're gonna test. And so you can see, just under 2.1 volts. Again, we're expecting to see everything a little bit higher than in the instructions, just because of our little bit higher wall voltage. So I'm happy with that reading. Hey, Tommy, before we uh, continue on, I think this is in reference to step 70. Uh, Crino B says, I have about 420 volts there. Is that still okay? We're looking to be around 479. Yes, that's okay. Um, you might end up with a little bit more crunch a little earlier in your circuit um, with a little bit lower B+, plus, but that's, that's still within reason for sure. All right. We've so got our a... next step is checking the DC voltage at islets 22 and 24. And this is on step... This is still step 71 or 69 in my instructions. Yeah, so on page 27, first step. So um, I'm going to check 24 here. I don't know if you can see that, Rachel. Give me a little tilt when you can see it. But yeah. You can do that after. So okay. Really yeah, if you can see it from above. So I, I'm going to move my meter up to a higher voltage, 600 volts DC. And I can see I've got 270 approximately. Again, higher than what it says in the instructions, but not too much cause for concern. And at 22, I've got 267. Those are gonna be a little bit different, 22 and 24. They should be close, I'd say within 10 or 15 volts. And they should be you know, within reason, close to what the instructions say. So again, I was just testing at islets 22 and 24. All right. And that is our plate voltage for the 12AX7 tube. And uh, Sassy Cat asks, do we have a mock-up of the circuit board prior to installation available to look at when we're reference, <coughs> excuse me, when we're referencing points? Um, we don't have one here physically besides, you know, this spare, but There's that's a little too crowded. There's two completed wiring diagrams in the instructions. Exactly. Yeah, you can find the completed diagram on page 24 of the instructions uh, right before we, where we started for this episode. So at the end of our step that we just completed, there are some recommendations if you find low voltage for your plate voltage for the 12AX7s at 22 and 24. This is supplied from this filter cap via behind the board jumper. A common problem when building this circuit is that jumper falling out. Um, but as we saw, we have proper voltage there. So we're good to move on and test our 12, our 6v6 power tube. Another thing we need to do in this step is connect the speaker. If you don't have a speaker connected and you start playing the amplifier, especially and driving the, the output transformer, you could damage the output transformer. So it's really important with tube amps especially, but really all amps, that you have a speaker or what we call a load connected at all times while you're operating it. Right. Um, we've got plenty of questions coming in. Thank you, folks. So uh, let me just talk about this and then we'll install it. Perfect. Same deal, octal based tube. This one has six pins. That's our 6v6 tube. Has the same registration pin between eight and where pin one would be. And it's the same type of socket. So we've got a registration slot in the socket and a registration pin on our 6v6. Go ahead, Pete. All right. Uh, so a minor threat asks, how much of a gain difference is there between a 12AX7 and a 12AY7 in the 5F1 circuit? A 12AY7, I believe, is a gain factor of 30. A 12AX7 is a gain factor of 100. So you're going to get a lot less drive from a 12AY7. Um, it'll be pretty clean 
until you start overdriving your power tube. Normally 12AY7s are used more for driving an effect or used for a phase inverter. This amp doesn't have a phase inverter. Um, oh, sorry, I pulled that test lead off prematurely. So I'm gonna get my amp plugged back in. And this is our, this is our last real testing stage. I can see my pilot lamp turned on. If at this stage your pilot lamp doesn't come on, you may have a bad power tube and it may have caused the fuse to fail. But I can see that everything looks good. I'm starting to hear that pleasing, familiar low hum um, that is a good sign. Um, so I'm going to get my meter back out and do these last few tests. We're going to check in our low range at islet 12. This should be, you know, around 1.65. It's likely going to be closer to two for our purposes as we have a higher voltage, but it's not. It's 1.5. That's totally acceptable. And you can see that at islet 12. Did you catch that, Rachel? Oh, yeah. Sweet. Okay. So I'm happy with that. Again, that's, that's well within range. We're going to check a little bit higher range at volt at islet 19. Sorry, islet 20. So islet 20 is down here where this cap and resistor are. That is the cathode voltage for our 6V6 tube. This is also known as bias. And we're looking at 22.3. That's good by me. And now we're going to check islet 17, which Tom, is a B plus voltage supply for our power tube. Go uh, ahead, Pete. Before we move on so quickly, that's um, where we're going to check next. You mentioned bias uh, at the cathode. Um, excuse me. What was that? Uh, islet 20? Mm -hmm. What exactly is that setting? Can you speak uh, on bias a little bit? Yeah. So first, I'm just going to show you. We've got 353. In the instructions, it says 325. That's within range. I'm happy with that. That's under 10%. So I'm calling all of our voltages correct. Um, if you find significantly higher or lower voltages, you need to go back through and make sure everything's wired properly. And you need to maybe double check all of your solder connections. Um, the voltages could be higher or lower if you're missing a B plus filtering stage in one of these capacitors these filter caps. If one of these connections isn't right, if you lost this behind the board ground back here, or if your ground bus isn't properly connected, those can all cause voltage problems in what we were just checking, which is all our power side of our DC system. So bias is the difference between the grid and the cathode. The cathode supplies all the electrons that flow through a tube, and the grid is what your signal is connected to and changes depending on the waveform from your guitar pickup. So when the grid goes positive, it pulls more electrons. When the grid goes negative, it stops the electrons, and that's how amplification in a tube actually works. Um, so you need the bias to be set for each tube. And you can see the bias for this guy is set by this 1.5 resistor. And the bias over here is set by this 470 ohm resistor. All right. Um, man, we have a ton of questions rolling in here. All right. Um, 
Jamie Kemp, I believe the pit, uh, excuse me, the telly you're seeing in the background with the full pick guard is one of our mini T style kits, uh, which you can just search mini telly or mini T style on stumac.com. That should come up. Um, let's see. We okay. A minor threat has a follow up question, Tommy. They say since I have a 12 AY7 in their amp, uh, can they just simply take it out and switch it with a 12? AX7 with no modifications. It depends on your amp. It depends on what the tube is doing. Um, it'll fit, but they're not really all the same. Um, so I believe the only one that really probably won't work is a 12AU7, if you swap that for a 12AX7. But I would definitely um, check your user manual and see why that's a 12AY7 in your circuit. So folks, what I'm doing, since all of my voltages are checked out, I'm gonna get this thing ready to play. I've still got it on at three volts, or at, uh, on volume three. What I'm gonna do is turn it off and put my back panel on. Before I put my back panel on, I'm gonna drain those caps one last time, just to be sure since I'm gonna be working in and around the circuit. So I've got my snuffer stick clipped to ground. And I'm going to get in there at eyelet 16. You don't need to get directly onto the eyelet. You can get on the lead of the filter cap. I don't know if you can see that, Rachel. Wires. Yeah, there's a lot of wires in the way. There we go. That's great. Yeah, so anywhere on this lead is fine. You can drain all of them. Probably don't need to. Again, since we have a functioning amplifier circuit, these tubes probably drained all that B-plus voltage anyway. Really good to just be double, doubly sure when you're working with high voltage. Absolutely. Uh, so, Tommy, while you're setting that up and we're getting ready to test here, um, well, I guess, like you said, you're going to install that back panel first. I uh, want to make sure to get back. Uh, Santiago Colina is wondering um, how long it would take to ship an order to him in Spain. Uh, depends on when we receive it in the day, but generally, will arrive uh, depending on your shipping method three to five business days if you're paying for express after it ships or about two to four weeks if you're sending it just standard airmail. Um, here's a question better suited for Tommy though. Well, the amp kit probably isn't going to go airmail because it's heavier. Right. That would probably go economy. Um, JDS asks, when tubes need to be changed, what is the difference between matched and unmatched tubes? Will it really make a difference? Uh, let me screw these screws in, and then we'll talk about matched tubes. So I've got my drill set on a low torque setting so I don't overdrive these uh, screws. You want to overdrive your amp, not your screws. Um, so... Preamp tubes are not matched. Power tubes are often matched. The manufacturer or supplier or testing house tests them for a few different, um, a few different values. They test transconductance and plate current mostly. Those are the two big ones for a power tube. Matching tubes make setting your bias easier in a fixed adjustable bias amp. In an amp like this, uh, we have a cathode bias, meaning it's not going to be something you're changing when you change a power tube. There are a lot of cathode bias tubes out there, or amps out there, um, Supro amps, Fender amps. Um, a lot of them are really popular. A cathode biased amp is a pretty inefficient amp as far as design goes, but they often just sound great. Um, so it, it really depends on your amp. Um, and then as far as matching, some mismatching is actually kind of good. Um, you can get these nice harmonics um, when they start to break up that you can't get with a perfectly matched set of tubes. Um, but again, the, the most common process is to get as close as you can um, as far as matching your power tubes. And there's a lot of discussion um, on both sides about what's, what's right or wrong. Um, 
but but I've I've heard amps that have mismatched tubes that sound absolutely fantastic. And sorry to uh, kind of delay. I know the tension's really building, and I want to get to actually playing through this amp. But I think this question kind of follows along. If the bias, sorry, Mike Collins asks, if the bias is not intolerance, how do you adjust it? In this amp, you would be swapping a resistor. In adjustable fixed bias amps, there's often a trim pot um, that you can you can change that that value up or down um, to adjust it. Um, and again, this amp is extremely simple, so it doesn't have any adjustment. And it is just another reason why I love it so much because I can just pop a new 6v6 in there and see how it sounds different. Um, so, so folks, having confirmed all of my voltages and the final assembly of my amp, we're going to go ahead and turn this thing on and see how it sounds. We're going to start at fingers a low volume. Crossed. Yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. We're going to start at a low volume. I'm going to turn it to about three. And reminder, we are live here, so we, we would love to test this beforehand, but, uh, you know, sort of the name of the game, we're live so we can take your questions and also, I guess, put ourselves out there and hopefully don't fall flat on our faces. Yeah. So, drum roll. Yeah. So, again, it takes a minute for your amp to warm up after just about 10 seconds or so. You should hear noise. And that's good. So again, at a very low volume, and I'm plugged into input two, which is our low jack, um, you should have a very clean tone. Perfect for, you know, bedroom playing, practicing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it up a little bit, maybe to around six. You should start hearing just a little bit of breakup. Nothing too crazy yet. So what I'm listening for is oscillation, um, pops, cracks, static, anything that isn't um, just a nice, quiet, low hum, and my guitar signal. Sounds good. Sounds like I've got all the frequencies. I'm not missing, not missing anything. I'm going to go ahead and turn it up a bit more now. We're going to go up to nine. This should be pretty close to break up. Should be a nice crunchy sound. Great. Sounding good. Now we'll give a little, little crunch. That's what we want to hear, folks. We've got a tube amp. Congratulations. Woo! Give yourselves a hand. Nice job, Tommy. So if you had any problems in that testing section, or if you turn it on and it just doesn't sound right, um, absolutely go back through the testing with a really suspicious eye. Um, it's really easy to make a small mistake that can just cause your amp not to work. Um, if you're not able to figure it out, please email us at service at stumac.com. Um, we're always happy to help. I'll probably ask you to send me some photos of your circuit. But if you did get this far and it sounds great, just give yourself a round of applause for building a point-to-point -point hand wired tube amp uh, because that's no small feat. Yeah, and the greatest part about this is this is just the beginning. All of these skills that you've been learning and developing can all be applied to pretty much every hand-to-hand -hand or point-to-point -point amp build and yeah, yeah. This is foundational and... for sure. These same techniques carry through um, to any kind of islet board build, and they translate pretty well to our turret board builds as well. Um, that's the other popular kind of hand-wired amp, which we have a, a couple of those at this point too. Yeah. So we, you know, chose to demonstrate the build of the uh, 57 mini tweed amp kit, uh, but that's just one of five amp kits we have. So if you've built this or you're interested in the other ones, 
Uh, we also have a 59 Tweed 15 watt, a 62 Britflex 45 watt, a 65 P Reverb 15 watt, and a 66 D Reverb 22 watt. Yeah. Um, before we sign off here, uh, I do want to say we've got a couple last questions. Um, again, you know, please feel free to email service at stumac.com if you have any issues or need help troubleshooting. Um, let's see. Oh, wow. Yeah, and you can skip through the ones that we've already done. Okay. Um, thank you, Susan. Let's see. So the first one I have here is uh, Anthony Orzino says, why no vent on the back panel? It's not how they did it in the 50s. Um, most of the heat in this amp is on the outside with those chassis mounting components, the transformers and the tubes. Um, and as you can see, this amp has an open back. So all that heat can escape. If you're really cranking this thing for, say, an hour, this, chat, this metal chassis may get a little hot. But... I, I think um, those vents really came in when everything was kind of inside of a, inside of a head um, with, with no real way to get out. Um, and I just think a vent would ruin the aesthetic. But you could put a vent in if you want, if you've got some carpentry skills and you're good with redoing tweed. And uh, let's see, we have a question. Also, excuse me, oscillation overdrive ask how can I add treble, middle, and gain knobs? You get a different amp. It's not all gonna fit in this amp. Um, if you wanted to add a tone knob, you probably could, um, but you would definitely need to find a different chassis if you were gonna add any more than one knob. As you can see on this, on this control panel, there's just not space for three more pots. Um, and again, inside of that circuit, this chassis is so cramped. Um, and really the beauty of this amp is its simplicity and how connected you are to the circuit, to the tubes, without all those other controls. So part of the reason it's a great studio amp is because there's one setting. If you have it on six, it's gonna sound like that every time, no matter how many takes or how many days later it is that you're going back to punch in and fix, you know, a, overdrive, a lead or an overdub or something. All right. And a few more here. Um, well, first, Santiago Colina, give you a shout out. Tommy, he was uh, pretty pumped that you played Ooh La La by the Faces. And we did, we, they wanted us to carol afterwards, which I can't remember carols. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> also, hold on, Susan, go ahead and stand up there in front of the camera. They want to meet you after hearing your voice for almost a month. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Hi, Susan. I don't She's know. Cleaning up. <laughs> She's cleaning up Tommy's mess. As always, I appreciate it. All right. Uh, Gary Alexander asks, is this amp a push-pull or a class A? And if it is a class A, can I run 6L6s or EL84s? You, it is a class A. Um, I don't know that there's such a thing as a push-pull amp with only one power tube. But if you wanted to use different tubes, you'd need to probably change your transformers as well. Um, this, this amp is certainly moddable, but it's small form factor and very simple design um, doesn't lend itself to as much modding as some of our other circuits like the P reverb based on uh, the AA1164 circuit, uh, which is really moddable. So if you're into that kind of thing, I would definitely recommend doing a bit of research and seeing what kind of mods you were looking to do. Um, for this amp, you're not gonna get more output by going up to a 6L6. Um, it's only gonna get as loud as it gets. Um, it's got a pretty, pretty undersized output transformer and a low, a low wattage speaker. All right. 
Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone joining us. Really, without you all logging in, you know, viewing this, we wouldn't be doing it. Uh, so a big, big thank you from everyone here. Uh, and please, please feel free to leave comments uh, on these videos, what you'd like us to do next. Um, we love making these videos for you guys. So please sound off in the comments and let us know what you'd like to see. Uh, I want to give a huge, huge thank you to Tommy Stump thank for you, leading Pete. us through this. Thanks, Pete, for hosting. Thanks, Rachel, getting those great close-ups. And thanks, Susan, for making sure I don't get off track and keeping everything going smoothly. All right. Uh, so, yeah, again, huge, huge thankful to, thank you to everyone. Um, and we hope to be doing more of these videos in the future for you. These will all stay up on our YouTube channel archive so you can go back through and review them at any time. Um, Tommy, why don't you play us out? Uh-oh. <laughs>